this is as scary as I imagined it to be. And I, my imagination went really wild, so <clears throat> you know, bear with me while I warm up. Um, my name is Joe, and uh, I'll be talking a tiny bit about politics and design. Uh, I was raised, I'm Colombian, and I was raised thinking that there are two topics that you do not discuss, religion and politics. Um, my mum, dad are not here, so I will be talking about politics. Um, but also, when I was putting this presentation together, I was like, oh, it's a shame that that was the case. Um, because I think it would have taught me valuable lessons um, of, I think we talked to it this morning, heard uh, amazing, uh, amazing speakers talk about empathy, really listening, debate, discourse. Um, but I didn't have that, and I probably went the long way around to acquire these. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through um, my uh, political awakening, I suppose, through work. Um, as um, the guys just explained, I'm creative director for the people, and I would probably say that's kind of where um, my journey starts. Let's say back in 2019, um, you know, I'm surrounded by incredible people uh, doing incredible work, some of this... Um, work that you're seeing on stage, and you know it was good. Uh, I was comfortable. I knew what I was doing. Branding was my thing, but you know something was off. And um, <laughs> a lot of people have said something was off. Something's always off. And for me, it was this. It was like the world was fucked. I think the world is still fucked. Um, I don't know if I could swear, so apologies. But I. Um, it, it, it was like what I was doing at work did not correspond to what I was seeing later on the news, on the phone. I was like there seeing the country ravaging by fires and then it's like, oh, let me just go do this color palette. It was like, how does that, how does that work? And it really made me question my responsibility and accountability in all of this. And I think many of you will have not have had this type of like crises, almost philosophical existential crisis in what we do. I think that was one of them. Um, and then there's this thing. Design is apolitical. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but but why, why was it that I thought that that was the case? And I think it's, I was trained as a designer to be objective, you know, to be rational, and in a way that gives almost like the next step is that design sits about above politics. You know, it doesn't, you don't really need to voice your concerns or your, or your politics through what you do as a medium. Um, and I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that just doesn't, it did, didn't resonate. Because we, we are problem solvers, right? but we should be able to question the problems that we're trying to solve. And, um, and it's really hard, especially back then, because branding is so linked with capitalism, right, the problem, that um, how is it that I'm going to do something meaningful in that realm? At the end of the day, capitalism is about growth, about the bottom line. So here I am trying to find meaning in consumption. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm not the first person to question this relationship. Um, this is the first things first manifesto by Ken Garland, written in the 60s. Um, it's pretty incredible. You know, back then I'd probably say if you would replace the word advertising, with branding or graphic design, you'd get the same intent today. I don't have to do that exercise because this manifesto has been updated, and uh, this is the 2020 version. Um, and I just want you to read, I'll read you a tiny section of it. <clears throat> Our time and energy are increasingly used to manufacture demand 
to exploit populations, to extract resources, to fill landfills, to pollute the air, to promote colonization, to propel our planet's sixth mass extinction. We've helped to create comfortable, happy lives for some and allowed harm to others. Our designs at times serve to exclude, eliminate, and discriminate. And check this one, you know, I love it. We sell pills to pop, ticks to talk, and a scrolling feed that never stops. And then the desire to consume it all over again and again. Yes, commercial work has always paid the bills, but many designers have let it become, in large measure, what designers do, and this, in turn, is how the world sees us. It's pretty powerful, right? Um, you can go online, you can sign it. I don't know how this sits with you, but this really resonated with me. Because this is very personal. I believe that aligning one's personal value system with our work ethic is the only acceptable way to work. I should probably caveat, this is my belief. You know, and I think everyone has different types of values, but this is what I just genuinely believe in. Um, I also say this with care, because it is an extreme privilege to be able to pick the clients that align with our values, right? Um, so I am aware of that, and I don't, you know, I think that we should be careful, though, that in the need to pay the bills, we just decide to work with, you know, Evil Corp. So, yes, um, there I was, questioning, you know, having a bit of an existential crisis, um, you know, probably not that dissimilar to what was happening in the world around me, right? Enter the West Coast. Um, this is an incredible shot um, of outside of Queenstown. This is in the west coast of Tasmania. And um, we got a brief, I think late 2018, early 2019, when I was having this, this, um, this, all these thinking in my mind. Um, and it, um, the brief was, can you help us build the identity for this community? And it's a community that has been dependent uh, on declining heritage industries like mining and forestry. It's as beautiful as this shot is, if you look closely, like look at those mountains. They have been destroyed by these industries. They should all be looking like these. And now it looks like, you know, like Mars. Um, and it really got the team questioning, like, can we improve the human condition through what we do? Can design change a place for good? Can we really make a difference? Were we just kidding ourselves? We took the job on, naively, thinking, I'd probably say naive was our biggest strength. Um, and yeah, that was, that was, um, well, that was the beginning. We also didn't have any um, point of reference in terms of place branding. Typically, up until then, you think about place branding and you'd probably think about um, kind of property development. Uh, so that the kind of, which at the end is still someone's bottom line, right? So we didn't really have a reference and we went to like the OG of uh, place branding and uh, that's Milton Glaser's I Love New York logo, which is incredible, super powerful, but it lacked depth in terms of our, um, as a reference for us. And it lacked depth not because it's, it's one of the most iconic word marks there is. It lacked depth because New York didn't have an identity problem. You know, New York is not unappreciated like the West Coast Tassie was. So it wasn't really a point of reference for us. Then there's this. Um, that's me. And I grew up in a coal mine, well, not in the coal mine, but in one of those mining towns in Colombia. Um, it's not any coal mine, it's the second biggest coal mine in the world, right? And it pretty much um, has set me, you know, in the path that I am. It paid, like, I'm a direct fossil fuel privilege girl. Um, it, made my parents be able to afford me going abroad, you know, set me on a path as to being here on stage. So 
Uh, it's taken me a lot of years to come to terms with this relationship. Um, yeah, quite a bumpy road. I also understand what it's like for communities to rely on these type of industries for survival. I'm not comparing the west coast of Tasmania in 2018 to Colombia in the 90s, but we need to understand that it's never black and white. You know, it's not because I am, you know, vocally opposed to these uh, industries that I should say just ban them. Um, and that kind of gave me a bit of a, an insight and was about to um, it's about to go my way. Another context for you is that Tasmania, aside from being a magical place, um, has also a lot of history when it comes to this relationship. So this incredible shot, some call an engineering fee, is the Gordon Dam, and it was built in 1972. And to be able to build it, you had to flood this lake called Lake Petter, an incredible lake. It was flooded, then they built that. Of course, you know, that didn't go out as easily as this. This divided the state, you know, and even more powerful, it was um, the trigger for uh, the Green Party. The first world's Green Party was born in Australia, was born in Tasmania, pretty epic. Um, I don't know if you, well, the Australian Green Party, Australian Green logo, similar to the No Dams, that was, you know, part of the uh, protest sign over there. And even though it was not called Green Party back in the 70s, it, you know, took a decade to change, but that's pretty awesome, right? So Tasmania has a really strong relationship with, you know, the, this kind of, um, yeah, a strained relationship with this. Um, I can't come up here, talk about politics, and not get a tiny bit political, but there are some really, really bad laws being passed currently, uh, anti-protest laws um, that are being passed across different states. Please keep an eye on that, um, because they are undemocratic and unnecessary. So, back to the West Coast. I was thrown into um, having extremely hard conversations with people. And this is very different than the research that I'd done in the past, where you interview stakeholders, and you like, understand this tech, and then you talk about with the engineers and the consumers. We're talking about livelihoods of people. I've had, you know, it takes an emotional toll coming out of all of that research, because the things that you hear are, I am not prepared to handle it. I am a designer. I don't have any background in anthropology, you know. I don't know how to handle these conversations, and there I was being exposed to really, really hard ones. And <clears throat> I think one, uh, the, one of the hardest ones that I've ever had to deal with um, was around this very strange, for not saying broken, relationship between a lot of the councils that we've worked with and the Aboriginal community. And, um, and, and, and it was hard, you know? It's hard because there is no trust. At the end of the day, the councils are government, uh, you know, they're elected or not, and that relationship has been broken for years, right? And I think that we need to accept that we live in a place, we live in a place that has not accepted the responsibilities of its actions. And I am talking, you know, about returning of land, I'm talking about reparations, I'm talking about simple things like um, just the fact to have Aboriginal community represented in the council, right? That's sometimes not the case. So if that's not the case, then there's no trust, and there's no trust, we're put, put in almost like as a bridge to try to create this link. But I am a designer. I don't know this. And this is a project to, to create a brand of a community that they are part of. It's, it's incredibly hard. And the challenges of voice by a community are inextricably linked with the output of the work. If nothing else, they're a vehicle to bring hard truths to the surface. It's exactly what we do, you know. We hear these, um, kind of these, these, these truths, and we weave in some sort of storytelling, you know, but these, these are good exercise for us to bring these hard truths to the surface uh, and to also kind of change the power from the government back to the communities. <clears throat> in order to do so, um, we have to reach as many, of, it's not as many members of the community, but like 
as many different pockets, different types of people of the community. I don't know if you're familiar with Candy Chang, um, but uh, the initiatives that she does on the grassroots sides are incredible. They've been a huge source of inspiration for, for the people and how to really, you know, go almost like guerrilla, grabbing some uh, insights from people. This is I Wish This Was project, and it's um, these tiny stickers that she puts on the um, abandoned buildings in the neighbor, leaves them for a week, and then people write what they think you know, this was. I really like Brad Pitt's, Brad Pitt's house. I wish that was not the case. Um, we had to do similar things. This is an example for a Bruni Island project that um, we had to do. And our, it was in the midst of the pandemic, so it was very hard to do remotely. Um, we had to reach a lot of Bruni Islanders. Our typical ways of doing that, which is like Facebook group, uh, newspapers, radio, it was like we tried everything, but you know, some Bruni Islanders are definitely greenies off the grid. They didn't want anything to do with the internet. So we're like, okay. Um, we had uh, some info packs delivered on the ferry for any resident that would take the ferry that had the resident sticker on them, and some people didn't even e leave the island. So no matter how much we tried, we still had people that was like, I've never heard of the project. <laughs> um, after we capture all of these, um, as I said, kind of impressions and tensions, um, we put them in the sort of field note. We start weaving in kind of our storytelling, our brand. Um, and it's, it's funny because I've heard it say quite a lot, but and sometimes it's hard to believe, but it sometimes does take an outsider to see the value of a place, to hear, to be able to be distant enough um, and have almost like a different perspective on why this place is so valuable to people. <clears throat> this type of um, really close relationship with the community, um, I've only explained how hard it is. I love my job, by the way. <laughs> but it's also hard in the dimension not only to be able to have these hard conversations, to be able to reach a vast pocket of community um, people, but also at the outside, outset of the work, um, you know, you've done all the like, years and years of work in there, and then you publish uh, things that they have seen because we share kind of regularly. And um, yeah, and then you get feedback. And, I am used to uh, my work being critiqued. You know, a designer gets critiqued every day. We also have, um, I did this really awful exercise, this is what I'm showing you here, of going through brand new blog and just capturing the worst comments that we've had at, for the people. And there are, there are, I remember one just saying, what the fuck? <laughs> um, there are some pretty, yeah, so I'm used to that. I've kind of thickened my skin for all these negative comments. But when you're doing place branding and it's the community that's telling you that something's off, that, that, that shit hurts. This was an uh, article um, that came out um, after we've released Joe and Valley Project in the Mercury, in the newspaper. And I just want to re read you this. Um, this tiger looks like it's been doing a poo for about 100 years. <laughs> Great. I don't even know how your imagination goes to, like, I don't, I don't know. Um, I love this one. It looks a lot like an Egyptian hieroglyphic that a five-year-old could draw. And is this a marketing ploy to get people talking about it, like the whole iSnack 2.0? Gosh, I hope so. Yeah. Um, since then, we have done many, many, many place branding projects, um, and I can't come up here and say, oh, I've, I've known the trick, I've solved it. it it's absolutely, don't know. Every single project is highly contextual. There's absolutely no shortcut um, to, to getting to the crux of uh, finding the identity for a community. Um, the task at hand, this is the thing I love, the task at hand when you do place branding is to find you know, that common ground that links people beyond geography, right? And if you think about it, 
something that unifies a community, I feel that at times it's like, I can feel like I'm up against a current of companies and algorithms that are doing the complete opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, this non-stop division that's happening is, um, yeah, is at odds with what we're trying to achieve through place brand. Um, and sure, you know, there's a, um, there's a lot of things that we've learned, and I think there's a lot of things yet to resolve. <laughs> I think one of the first ones um, is that how do you measure impact and how do you measure success for these things? It's very hard because, you know, typically on brand projects, you know, you have reach and impressions and, you know, things that you can put in awards and numbers that kind of validate your result. When it comes to communities, the ask is so big that the outcome is very so slow. At times, it can be up to years, you know? Um, so our challenge already, you know, measuring impact is already like a dark art, uh, but it's, it gets exponentially harder when it comes to communities. Um, and in the same measure, the people that engage us to do the work, the council members, um, are elected members. So those that are in power today will not be in power tomorrow. So how do you make a project supersede elected members? And should it? Right? Um, I don't know the answer for that. That is also a question that we're trying to solve. For the West Coast in particular, because it was the first place branding project that we did, we've ha we have had the pleasure to work alongside them for a few years, so we've kept kind of track of how that project is running. And I think maybe like two years ago, um, my friend Matt and I went to the West Coast, and these are a whole lot of... Um, people just taking the brand and you know, owning it completely and doing, you know, their, their thing, their thing with the brand. And I, and I love it. I love that, you know, you can, as well as a branding designer, you're instructed to like do these guidelines and like obey these things. But when the brand comes to life like this by people that have, you know, different design literacy, um, this is, this is great. I remember one case in particular, there's this um, lady that's a volunteer in a museum and she, it's like, I don't even know how to load the fonts in her computer, and we tried for hours, and it's a very old computer. And, um, and then she was like, well, so, so I did this. So she had printed out some of the stuff that we'd done, and she cut it out, and she knows how to do a photocopy, and she was doing amazing posters with just like, love it, like that, that's exactly what you, know, uh, you should be doing. The other thing that we haven't really figured out is this kind of playing politics situation, right? Because we work with councils, they're part of government, they, there are agendas involved, you know, political agendas. We can get caught up in that, you know, and sometimes that bureaucracy can slow a project, can kill the intention of a project, and we haven't found really a way to navigate that currently. So, <clears throat> after all of this, you know, I really asked myself, what is, what is my place in the world? Big question. Also, don't have an answer for that. I don't know why I'm asking you. Um, but it is really, it's naive to think that a designer acting alone can make a difference. And I probably would say that going through these like place branding journey that's taken a few years and being able to see the community not as like the end result, the people that get it, but co-creating with people that have not been um, educated in the design as I have, working with them to come up with a, uh, with a brand or with, a, with identity, has just, just, just given me so much more meaning in what I do. Um, it is, it's helped me be part of like some so, so sort of civic discourse, have a say um, in what I believe it's right, stand up for communities that are marginalized, use the opportunity of the brand to do so. Um, it really gives me hope to understand design as a social and political force. Um, and I'm incredibly proud and honored that that's what I do now. Um, and I think, just to end it, it 
Um, it made me develop all those tools that I didn't grow up with. Um, and I can have very heated conversations on WhatsApp with my family now, um, in the midst of one of the most you know, controversial uh, political, pol political uh, elections that are happening in Colombia in a few weeks, similar to what was happening in Australia. Um, there is still deep respect in these conversations. They're not, it's not, they're not full of hate, because I've learned it. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy that I can do so. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.